that? It's my one gift. That's my superpower. Big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Put it to good use. Best of my abilities. Uh, good morning, everybody. How are you? Um, my name's Carrie Rose, and I'm the executive director of the Parent Teacher Home Visit Project, which is a nonprofit collaborative comprised of members from schools and districts, teachers' unions, and community groups, and in particular, faith based community groups. And we have been in partnership together since 1999 with the idea that we might be able to create safe space for families and school staff to get together and share what are their common hopes and dreams for student success in a way that helps us align our language so that we can then use that as a foundation to develop a strategic plan together. What is success going to look like for each and every child? That was the idea of why we got together, but it wasn't like we started out understanding that that's really like the best strategy we could think of to start. We started in Sacramento. Yesenia and I have been friends and colleagues for probably 18 years now. Um, and we met through a community organizing effort. Um, so our roots go back to the faith-based community organizing world. And in particular, that world is about building leadership development in communities so that everyday people can make extraordinary change. And they were looking um, at schools in particular. Yesenia was a parent in one of the communities where the work was starting. And she's going to share her story in a bit, because really that's what this is all about, is how does this bring folks who are in community into relationship with each other in a way that helps students move forward academically, right, to be successful in school. So a couple of things about our project. Um, we really had no intention of ever becoming a national network. We really just wanted to do some good work in Sacramento. We started in 1998 in eight pilot schools, but what we didn't know was how hungry everybody else around the country was for this same conversation. So we just kept getting all these calls from people saying, could you just share your stuff with us? And we were like, sure, you know? So we were passing it along, and then they're like, well, can you just come have a training with us? Because people are interested, but they really want to understand what's the point of this visit? How does it look different than home visits as they've normally happen. We're like, sure. And then pretty soon it just got so big, we're like, you know what, we better think about this a little more intentionally than how we're doing it right now. So we started gathering folks together um, and now have over 300 schools in 19 different states that are doing home visits under this particular model. We just met in Boston as a national network and just last year um, our parents and teachers together conducted 30,000 home visits. So it's really extraordinary when you think about what's possible. Um, and it, it's not rocket science, but it does take some work and some discipline around the strategy. So I wanted to just frame that a little bit and then turn it over to Yesenia. So a couple things you should know, no matter where you go around the country, there are some things that are true about our home visits. And for many of you, how many of you already do home visits in your world, right? So this will be familiar to many of you. There may be some differences. The concepts are basically the same, but we find that if we stick to these five common strategies, these principles about our work, then local communities can adapt it in a myriad of ways that make sense, but we need these five things to be true for us to get the kind of outcomes that we are looking for with our data collection and for student success. So the first is our visits are always voluntary. Voluntary for the staff at a school and voluntary for the participants, the families. So nobody ever has to conduct or receive a home visit if they don't want one. Secondly, we train and compensate folks to go out so that they understand the purpose of the visit is a relational model. And that visit lasts for about 30 minutes. So it's, it's not a particularly long time. We pay folks, though. The compensation is one hour. Around the country, we have traditionally supported that with Title I dollars at the district level, although we've used a whole bunch of resources, safe schools money, other um, federal grants as they're available, and a lot of times um, foundations or uh, seed funding, especially from our national unions, AFT and NEA have been particularly supportive in helping start this work. We also send folks out in pairs. So people go and choose, and anybody who works at the school can be part of it. We like the lead person as much as possible to be either a classroom or subject matter teacher, but the second person could be anyone who works in the school, everyone from the front office person to the bus driver to a language interpreter, whoever else, as long as they're part of the school community, they're welcome to be a part of it. And then um, we make sure we don't target kids. Which is interesting because if we're Title I funded, we're almost always in communities that are struggling, so how do we not target? 
So one of the things we've realized is that in every school, in every program, there are some kids that are doing well, or at least better, <laughs> and there are some kids who are struggling more. And so we try and do at least a random sampling. If we can't visit all the kids, we try and visit intentionally kids across that spectrum. And then last but not least, and this really is the thing I think that distinguishes our model, um, is that we do not go with paper, pen, any paperwork whatsoever. We show up and the sole purpose of that visit really is to exchange hopes and dreams. This is what my vision of success looks like for your student. I'm interested in your vision of success. You start aligning language because for us, even though language was such a, we thought initially going to be such a big barrier for us with home visiting, it wasn't the language we speak from our ancestors. It was the language of school on one hand and community on the other, not matching up. So, so that's a big piece of where this conversation goes. And that is the hardest thing for people to do because teachers want to teach. Social workers want to help. <laughs> it's really hard for us to not walk into a family's home and do what we do really well, but instead to just there, be there, share hopes and dreams, and listen. And that's it, right? We have a structure. There's other things we talk about, the family's background, which we said you will share a little bit about the student's interests when they're not in school. We line this up with the data about where we know kids are at risk and where families drop off. But that's really the whole piece, really, is if you walk in and talk hopes and dreams, you're good. So that's the Home Visit Project. It's really not rocket science. We usually visit um, elementary schools once in the fall and then uh, visit the student again in the spring. Um, the first visit's all about building relationship. The second visit is about sharing information. And the motto, if you will, about our visits is people don't care about what you know until they know that you care. So our first visit is about the school community stepping out in a new way to show that we care so that then family are willing to be more open to what we know. Um, at the middle school, high school level, as the project has grown, that first visit tends to be what we call a transitional visit as kids are coming into the school. So we'll send out at our comprehensive high schools, we'll just team up the staff and they go out and do several hundred home visits with all their incoming ninth graders. And then we do the second visit around career and college readiness. So usually around their sophomore, junior year. So that's a big picture, um, but you know, that's great, that's theory, that's model. More importantly is what does it look like in practice? So I'm gonna turn it over to Yesenia. So, and by the way, she's the founding parent of our project, so please welcome her with a lot of love. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm so excited and happy to be here with you and um, to share a little bit about myself and who I am and how and why I got involved um, in the Parent Teacher Home Visit Project. And I'm still around after all these years. Um, I'm, I, am, I live in Sacramento, with where Carrie also lives. I, I am the mother of six girls. My oldest is 30 years old and my baby is 20. Um, I also have six beautiful, gorgeous grandchildren. Um, so I'm starting all over again. But I wanted to share with you a little bit about myself and how I, I came out of my shell as a parent. So I, I was born in Mexico and I was raised in San Jose, California. And um, my parents both lived in the fields. We all did. They worked in, in, in the fields, so we moved a lot. Um, I grew up in, I'm the oldest of seven brothers and sisters. My, uh, I, grew up in, I, I grew up in a home where my father was very abusive. Um, he was an alcoholic, so, and I was the oldest of the family, so a lot of the abuse happened to me. I was um, mentally abused, I was physically abused, and I was also sexually abused by my father. So I was a very, very shy child. Um, I was really afraid of, of people and really afraid of, of adults. So, um, and I got to go to school whenever I got to go to school. It was not my choice, it was my father's choice. So, um, as you can see, growing up, as I got older, my goal was to get out of my home. That was my goal. So, um, I really loved my elementary school. And then in my elementary school, I met this incredible, amazing resource teacher who took me under her wing and protected me as best as she could with um, whatever they were allowed to do back in the day, which 
nothing was reported, right? Um, and then I had to go to seventh grade. I moved on from elementary school. And when I got to middle school, I got very lost. I didn't know what to do. I was very shy. And we were, we were bullied all the time. We were the kids from the other side of, of, of the tracks. We were the dirty kids. You know all that part of, of, of history. Um, so it was really hard, really, really hard to come to. And we were bused across town to go to a very middle class um, high school um, all the way through. I mean, it was elementary, middle, and high school. So by the time I got to high school, I was completely lost. And again, my goal was to leave home. So I dropped out of high school when I was in 10th grade, and I got married. And when I was 18, I had my first baby. And um, I remember the entire time I was pregnant, uh, my whole goal in life by then was, I'm going to change the world for this baby. And then I had five more. Then I really had to change the world. <laughs> and guess what? I had no idea how to do that, because I went from one abusive home into another abusive home. And I lived in that abusive home for 20 years. So um, in 1996, I moved to Sacramento. And I was very blessed to encounter and be around when the idea of the parent-teacher home visit came along. And my daughter by then was in fifth grade, and she was reading at a first grade level. And I was very desperate, and I did not know what to do. Um, I always went to everything that happened at the school because I wanted the school to know that I, that I was a good parent, that I wanted to be involved. And I always go, to, I used to go to the conferences, and when I was at the conferences, I always left so devastated. And I, le and I would cry every time because I would always get, she's here, but she needs to be up here, and then sign, and goodbye. And I did not know what to do. So all I could do was just cry and cry and cry. So one day I just decided, I, said, I, I, I reminded myself that I was going to change the world, and I was terrified that my child was going to go into seventh grade. And I did not want her to have the same experience that I had. Even though she's not my child, she's somebody else's child because she has the biggest mouth. <laughs> but, her, but she knew she was struggling. And her way of dealing with all that was just being bad in school. That's the way she went through. And she was constantly being in trouble, constantly being defiant with the, the, the teachers and staff at the school. And that was just her way of defending herself because she was so behind. So I decided I was going to go to the school and really ask for help. I needed, I needed to be her voice, and I did not know how. Because I came with a lot of luggage. I came with my lack of education, which was a big barrier for me, with my, my home culture, where my parents were never involved in anything at the school. I didn't know what an involved parent was supposed to do. And then at the same time, I was thought, you go to school and you do what your teacher tells you because they're the ones that know what you're supposed to be doing. So I couldn't sit across the table from the teacher and, and question her because of all the, the luggage that I was carrying with me. So the first time that I went to the school, I sat in the, in the office for 30 minutes. Nobody asked me what I was doing there. So I wrote my phone number on a piece of paper and I left it there and somebody told me that they would call me. And I went home, and nobody ever called me. So a couple of weeks later, I, I went back, because I was determined to have somebody talk to me. So I went back, and I sat there for 45 minutes. And the only reason I stayed that long was because I wanted to see if there were more parents that were coming into the school, if there were more parents that were just being ignored like I was. What was going on at the school? I really wanted to know where I ended up with my children. And of course, there were tons of parents that were coming in. And some were really angry and would just yell at whoever was there and then would storm out. So I finally gave up, and, and I also was leaving the school. And on my way out the door, I was cussing in Spanish. <laughs> and there was a lady walking in. And I just thought she was another parent. And she was the vice principal of the school. 
And of course, with my luck, she spoke Spanish and understood what I was saying on my way out. So she pulled me in, and, and she asked me what was wrong, and we started this conversation. And she was the one that brought the idea of me being a leader in the community organization. So that's, that's the, the way I became involved in this project. Now, when we, when we brought the idea to our school, um, our, our, teach, our school was, did not want to do home visits. So there was two of us uh, founding parents of this project. And um, my dear friend Jocelyn passed away seven years ago. So at the beginning of all this, we were very liked at our school. We were the good parents. They wanted our involvement because all they wanted from us was our signatures. When we got too involved, then we were just two angry moms that had nothing else to do. That's how she described, uh, our principal described Jocelyn and I in our local newspaper. So I was a Mexican angry mom and she was the African American angry mom. We were just two angry moms, had nothing else to do, but go and cause trouble at the school. And they told us no. They, they, they wanted absolutely nothing to do with, with us. Our principal said we should be thankful that the teachers and staff members were willing to come into our community to teach our kids. Did we realize where we lived? We lived in a low-income community, and these kids don't even stand a chance, so why should she try or, or ask her teachers or staff members to do something else or something extra for, the, for these families and these kids? And our kids were coming from homes where this community was so dysfunctional. In her mind, we were alcoholics, we were drug addicts, we were prostitutes, you name it, we were it. And they said, no, absolutely not. There is no way that we are going to do this. Um, and they didn't. So there were Jocelyn and me in a room by ourselves, well, not by ourselves, because the community organizer was there. Um, but our, our teachers and our staff members from the school walked away from us. And they told us they weren't going to do it. And I remember looking at Jocelyn and saying, well, there you go. Two years of uh, focus groups, two years of work to get this started, and we're not getting it at our school. And I said, I'm done. Don't you invite me to another meeting. But if you would have known our dear friend, you could never say no. If you did, she would come to your home and get you out. You would go to a meeting. <laughs> so we kept on going. We kept on doing home visits. And um, when our kids got to seventh grade, that was when we got our very first home visit. And Jocelyn's son and my daughter were in the same classroom in elementary school and, of course, in middle school. Um, and I got my very first home visit when my daughter was in seventh grade and she was reading at a, first, at a second grade level, excuse me. Um, and I had this amazing, incredible teacher that came to my home, and he didn't care if I was a prostitute, a drug addict, or an alcoholic. <laughs> Mr. Ford did not care about any of those things. He only cared about the kids, and he worked with us for two years in his regular class, in his <coughs> after-school program that he had, and two summers. And by the time those kids left middle school, and trust me, we did a lot of work. I don't know how many libraries I visited or how many books I read or heard them read to us. Um, but they t by the time they left middle school, they were all reading at grade level, every single one of them. My daughter is a medical administrator today. She is um, she's 30. She's in charge of a um, dental firm, and she's in charge of everything that has to do do with the doctors getting paid. I have no idea. It's a totally different language <laughs> for me. And she talks to me about it all the time. And I pretend like I understand what she's saying. I have no clue. Uh, but I just love to hear her talk to me about it because I, in my mind, I still see the little, my little girl, my seventh grader who was reading at a second grade level. And to see her where she's sad, it's just, it fills my heart every time. I'm starting all over again because I have six beautiful, amazing, gorgeous grandchildren, like I said. I have a seventh, the one that just started in seventh grade. And to see my, my daughters where they're at with their children is such a blessing for me. Because I've had home visits from everybody at the school except the janitor and the cafeteria lady. <laughs> everybody else has been in my home. And it's taking everybody from the school to help me raise those girls. 
it's incredible to see how they know that they need to be involved versus what I didn't know and what I had to do and what I had to go through. So to me, it's just a blessing to see that all my, my work that I did and everything that I learned, my girls are doing it now. And it's because they had those teachers and their, the coaches and the nurse and the social worker and, oh my God, the entire school for one of them, um, just to get her through. To, to know that they, they know that they, they can go and they know what to do. The counselors at the high school level, it's just amazing to me. I, yesterday, um, we had one of our dear friends um, who lives in Springfield, and he was talking about his daughter, and he was talking about when he had his home visit, he talked to her about how he needed help because the odds were against us. And I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot about that, and I think a lot about my grandchildren, and I, I think, oh my God, I'm gonna be 100 years old and I'm still gonna have to be coming to the schools because the odds are against us sometimes. I have um, two adorable, um, amazing um, little kids right now, one from each. Um, one is um, Mexican and Native American. And my, my grandson, who I adore to death, is Mexican and African American. And I just, I want, to change the world for them now. I want them to go to school and I want them to know that they're, they're only a child. And the people are gonna look at them and they're gonna look at them as children. Not as a color, not as a race, not as a poverty, not as none of that. I just want them to be seen as children. And that's where I, this is why I do this. I do this because I love children. I love children from everywhere. And, and I've been everywhere. I've been to Poplar, Montana. And I love my people in, in, in Montana and in the Native American reservations to the inner cities in Washington, D.C. We were just in New York on Monday and Tuesday. And they're just children and they need us. And as a parent, I'm here to tell you that we need you. I wouldn't be here, I would not be here today if it wasn't for a group of people just like you in this room that guided me and holds my hand and said, here I am, meet me halfway, we're gonna get this and it will be done. Thank you so much for being here today and for giving us this time. I just kind of wanted to come full circle on the secrets of collaborative conversation. So I was really struck in your um, word puzzle at the beginning where one of the statements was truth over artificial harmony, right? So um, I was struck by that because in the world of parent engagement, we talk a lot about collaboration, um, but you know, we don't always walk the talk about what real collaboration is. So here's the truth, it's hard, it's messy, it's complicated, it takes time. It takes a lot of time. So around the country, when we've shared this model, it's not that people's hearts aren't open to the idea of connecting. It's how do you really authentically create the space and the kind of conversation where you move past the um, edgy speak about, let's be co-educators, <laughs> into really meaningful partnerships that advance students forward. So for us, the secret of collaborative conversation is find a space where power is shared more equally than it is to the school site. For us, that turned out to be in the home. Sometimes it's an alternative location, but more often than not, the best visits are in the home. So the location matters. That the school steps forward matters. The secret in that sauce is that it can't just be one person's job at a school to do all the family engagement. And it definitely can't be if you want to try and link it to academic outcomes. It's got to come back to the classroom. And it also has to come back to the classroom because the secret of good communication is you have to know each other. And we don't know each other so well. We think we know, but part of the reason why home visits have been so successful is because we, it challenges our assumptions about what we thought we knew about each other, right? And we have a whole bunch of reasons why we make those assumptions. That's part of the training. Um, 
And then the third and final piece is you ask the right question, right? There's all sorts of work out there about, you know, the right question or um, I think there's even like a nonprofit that's all about asking the right question. Is anyone? Yeah, right. I thought, yeah. So for us, the right question came directly from the community organizing conversation of what is the one thing that's going to move you to meet me halfway, right? So for families, it was what do you hope and dream for your child? And then as an educator or as a representative of the school, I have to be willing to do the same thing that I am asking. I should never ask a family to do something for me I'm not willing to do for them. So I have to share my hopes and dreams. Here's the reason I got out of bed this morning. <laughs> Even though there's all this negative buzz out there about public education and my role and my job and how I'm just in it for the money or whatever it is that's out there, here's really why I got out of bed and I want you to know that. Here's what I dream for your child. Like that's all. It, I mean, it's. It's a secret, but it's not a secret, right? <laughs> it's just creating the right space, having the right people, asking the right question. So that's pretty much what we wanted to share. We, we were available. Is it okay if we take some questions or if anybody had any um, feedback or thoughts, reflections on what we've shared with you guys this morning? Yeah. Quick question. How did you go first to the family to broach the subject of home visit? How did you hear about your home visit from Mr. Ford? Oh, he, he did a phone call. He called me to set up an appointment to come visit me. So we never, ever, 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 ever drop in on a family unannounced. <laughs> That's a different kind of home visit. So we set an appointment. <laughs> we set an appointment with our families so they get a chance to volunteer in, usually through a phone call. It is by far the hardest part of our whole model, is setting up the phone call, getting to a yes, it's particularly hard in communities that have had multi-generational experiences of the school not serving them well. It's a little bit easier in communities, sometimes even new immigrant communities, where there's still a lot of hope about the American education system helping, so they're a little more open to it. It's harder when people have been disappointed for a very long time. So sometimes we'll meet in like a safe space, like a community room at a housing complex initially, because we've got to build trust. So it's always an appointment, usually with a phone call, um, and if we can't do an in-person conversation, then we just move on to another family. We don't ever do it by paper. Did you have a question also? I did. So I'm wondering what the carrot was that got the school to finally agree to. So in this day and age in public education, you would have to be an idiot as a leader to say family engagement isn't important, right? <laughs> Everybody knows it's important. There's a lot of research out there. So nobody's going to argue that family engagement isn't important. But the truth is, there still isn't a lot of support for them about understanding the kind of family engagement that makes a difference, especially for academic outcomes. So we spend a lot of time sharing data, sharing research. Like, you know, you know from the US Department of Education framework that there are certain kinds of things you want to have present in your family engagement, right? You want it to be relational. You want it to be building the capacity of staff as well as families, and you want it to be linked to learning. So then we have to look at our home visits. We have to do a lot of data collection, a lot of studies. So now we can go in there armed with that, but that's not how we started. You know how we started was some parents were brave enough to say yes, and some teachers were like, I've been doing home visits for forever. I just never knew there was a way I should do it that would be more effective. So we started with the willing and asked them to talk to everyone they knew. <laughs> so, so over time, we've gotten a little more sort of formal about our presentation sometimes with schools. But the truth is, usually those communities that called us and asked us to come, it was because some parent talked to another parent or some teacher talked to another teacher, and that's how they heard about us. So the school point is starting in relationships. Totally in relationships. That's a good point, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all about relationships, really, no matter what. Somebody else had their hand up over here. Had their hand up over here. I can't remember. I did, but it was a very similar question. I currently work with some schools that are like, well, we don't have time to do home visits. Our teachers are busy grading. Right. It, it rips my heart out every time I hear those words, and I've heard them three times in the past. Right. Like, right. But the truth is, also, I do have some empathy around the time conversation, partly because you know, raising my daughters in the school, they wasted a lot of my time as a parent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, it's just kind of like, I feel like I should show up because I know it's the right thing to do, but honestly, it's just kind of a waste of my time. Um, and, and I think a lot of school staff have been asked to do a lot of things in the years that haven't been a great use of their time. 
So I think people are naturally protective of that around school in general, family engagement not being um, separate. So part of what we do is to try and make this really doable in the life of a school time-wise. So our training for staff is three hours. We're going to go um, tomorrow to Florida because the staff either wants it after school usually or on a Saturday morning. Right? So we try to always accommodate the staff around when they want a training. We try and keep it manageable so they could do it after school. And we let them set their schedule for the visits. We let them pick the number they're going to do. They set their own schedule for it. Because um, people have a right to make a decision about whether this is a good use of their time. So we try and set it up so it's as school friendly as possible. But I'm with you, it's, it's hurtful because on the other hand, if we don't invest in the relational connections, it's really hard to imagine how all those grades are going to really pan out. <laughs> yeah? Some families may not be comfortable with home visits. How do you engage with those families? How do you, how do you connect with them? You want to, you want to field that one? Um, well, one of the choices is offering the alternative location. Um, and the re some of the times, most of the times when they say no, it's because they don't trust. And there's families gonna, they're gonna say no, and then they'll hear from another parent that has had a home <coughs> visit, and they'll agree to it, sometimes at the alternative location, and then from there move on to the home. And then you're gonna have families that say no. And it's okay, because it's voluntary. It's voluntary for, for staff members, and it's voluntary for families. So it's okay to say no. So what's the number one reason you think families say no? Like, what are, what's the trust? What are they worried about? They're worried that you're going to go into their home and you're going to report them. You're going to judge them and you're going to report them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that speaks a lot to the cultural disconnects. That speaks a lot to the socioeconomic disconnects about. And, and this happens a lot, I mm -hmm. think, um, when we train folks. Like, you guys are all here because you obviously have the heart for this work, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very hard, I think, for people who have the heart for this work to understand that out there in the universe, you're just a representative of an institution. Right? So they don't know your heart yet. They just know you're a representative of an institution that feels really scary. Mm -hmm. So getting the yes really is the hardest part sometimes because you have to get past that association of you being part of a bigger thing that may not feel so safe. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Is the phone call the first time that parents hear about a home visit or is there some setup prior to that so that they're yeah. expecting it? Well, there's, um, we were sharing this yesterday, there's the world as it should be, and then there's the world as it is, right? So the world as it should be is no, they never ever just hear about it for the first time on the phone call, because we've sent out a newsletter, the principal's called and given families a heads up. The world as it is, quite often, is that the first time the teacher calls, it's the first time the family's really heard it, so, or really understood what we're talking about. So in our training, we have to prepare folks as if it were the first time the family's hearing about it. Sometimes they've understood it. More often than not, if another family shares it, mm -hmm. that's the best way. So at a school that's starting home visits, we try and encourage the principal to bring a parent in to talk with other parents at like a you know, back to school night or a staff meeting. Like, I know you're going to be worried. I was worried. They called me. It's OK. Let them come. You know? <laughs> and that helps also move it forward. Um, yeah, so try and get the word out as much as you can in as many different ways, but the truth is the phone call really is often where it all comes, becomes real. Yes? Um, so you mentioned a little bit about academic success. Yeah. So in your data, is there some direct correlation? Do you have the information showing that by participating in the visits, there's a link to academic success? Sure. So, um, so I'm going to get there, but it's yeah. going to take me a second. Okay, so the question is, can we... Uh, do we have data that shows the connection to academic success, right, the link to learning piece? So when we first started this, it was very hard for us, to be honest, even though we were collecting data right from the beginning, um, because we're doing like immediate intervention, right? So the immediate change is you shift the perspective of the family and teacher. So that was the first thing we started measuring, was the shift in perspective. The intermediate change that happens then is you change your behavior because of your shifted perspective, right? So then we started measuring how are families changing their behavior with homework help or showing back up to events? How are educators in school changing their behavior around creating friendly schools or um, engaging with the family in more effective ways? 
Then we get to the third level. So we did get there with our first study where we looked at attendance rates, we looked at test scores, we looked at homework completion. So in Sacramento, we collected that as a longitudinal study and we did have positive outcomes around both academic success. But you know, with every study, have you guys ever done a study? The best you're ever gonna get from even a really great study is, there are promising indications, but <laughs> we're gonna need to study this more. So we got that, right? So we're like, okay, so we're gonna study this more. <laughs> So we've been collecting it all the way. Most recently, and all of this is available on our website, which you can see in the information packet. Just two weeks ago, our colleagues in Washington, D.C. completed a study that they shared publicly with Johns Hopkins, where they looked at the home visiting work in D.C. public schools based on this model. Last year, D.C. public schools did 10,000 home visits under this model. So it is really possible to do this at scale, right? Um, and they studied the impact of the home visits for kids um, versus kids who didn't have home visits in like schools or at the same school. And um, the outcomes from the study were that kids had a significantly higher attendance rate if they had um, a home visit and that their reading scores were improved, which is pretty amazing because you can usually see the needle move on math scores pretty quick, but to show reading scores, that, that was pretty exciting. So we continue to get it. Um, to be honest, where we're going next nationally in terms of data collection is that we are looking at mindset. Like, how does the home visit training shift a mindset, or does it? How does the visit shift a mindset, or does it? And how does the reflection that staff do with each other? Because at the end of the day, when we bring teachers back together after a home visit, here are the essential questions we're asking them. What did you think was true about the family before you went on the visit? What did you learn about the family's strengths while you were there? And how have you shifted the way you engage with the family and students back at the school because of what you've learned, right? So that's the national study that we're looking at next is the shifting of mindsets. And then, I'm sorry, and the mirror image too for the family. For the Thank you. Hmm. Yeah. You know, it's so funny, so, um, okay, so we're gonna just tell you all our dirt, our background, so. Um, <laughs> you're on camera, remember you're on camera. Oh, right, I'm on camera, okay, thank you, Rima. Good, good reminder. No, no, <laughs> no. Um, we have had, and I'm being truthful about this, we have had extraordinary partnerships with our local and national unions. Our whole network would not have expanded nationally if AFT and NEA hadn't stepped up and invested in us first. Mm -hmm. What we can tell you is that locally, Districts and unions will play each other off against each other all the time. So what happened in Sacramento when you guys, when you were first organizing, mm -hmm. you went and talked to the superintendent and what happened? Uh, he told us the union will never go for this. And right. we said, well, the union is already on board because we went to them first. <laughs> <laughs> so that happens all the time because people just naturally, like they have their own assumptions, like the union will never go for it. That has not been our experience no. around the country. That has really not been our experience. But I understand that there's like some buzz out there that people might naturally jump there, right? So we often, before we ever go into a school to do a training, we have asked, can we speak with someone from your union? Can we speak with someone from your district? We try and build that three-way collaboration that exists for us in communities where we first spread out because we know that unless everybody's, talk about like the secret of collaborative conversation, <laughs> how about you just remember to invite the people that you say should be involved in something to have the conversation, right? Instead of just having these side conversations. So we try to get everyone on a phone call together or in the room together. Um, because our compensation is completely governed by local contracts. So it has to make sense within the life of the local union and the folks who are gonna be helping set that for us. It's a good question though, thank you for asking it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about trust, and so the question I have is, how did you handle, how has it handled a teacher or someone coming into the home and seeing that there was safety concerns? Uh -huh. So the biggest, so, um, the biggest barriers around home visiting are time and fear, right? We've talked about time a lot, but we haven't really talked much about the fear beyond the, not beyond as if that's not enough, but <laughs> beyond the initial lack of trust the family might have. So fears for staff members, especially people who are drawn to home visiting is, you know what, I don't want to have to file a report on a family. <laughs> 
I love my families, and I'm afraid I will increase my odds of having to do that if I step into their home. So I think I just won't do it. So the very people who would be drawn to home visiting might have some anxiety about mandated reporting. Um, so what we have to do is really just look at the reality of it. So first of all, the model is very specifically designed so that you are not likely to see anything that's happening in my home, even though it's happening in my home. Right? It's happening across all lines. You're not going to see it under this model because you have had three to four opportunities as the parent to opt out before I walk through your door. So first we've called and asked if you would be willing to let us come, and you said yes. Then we reminded you the day of or the day before, and you said OK. Then we showed up when we said we were going to show up. That's an important one. We have to train people. You're responsible for your time. <laughs> and we ask if it's still a good time, and then the family lets us in. So there have been literally multiple opportunities for a family to self-select out if it's not a good time, and they do if it's not a good time. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, statistically, it's unbelievably, like, it's so insignificant a statistic about the number of times we've had our teachers follow up, but there have been some rare instances. And when we train, you know, there's always someone in the room who's like, it's going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> it always happens to me. So we have to, like, spend some time in the training on it. Um, so we just walk through a what if. Like, what if you see something? And then we just kind of walk it through. You're a mandated reporter. You know, so you have to take that seriously. Our philosophy has always been, if, if you gave someone three opportunities to opt out and they invited you in and you saw it, someone's asking you for help. So help them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we have never, even in all these years with all the, you know, we did, we've been counting lately, as many as we can tell, we're up to 82,000 home visits since we've started. Mm -hmm. We've never once had a, a complaint by a family filed about mm -hmm. someone coming for a home visit under our model, even though that has, rarely happened that a mandated report was filed. So we just did the best we can around that and prepare people as best we can. Yeah. Yes? Could you give me an idea of a conversation that takes place as you're calling your parents to initiate a home visit? Sure. Um, it goes something like this. You ready? I'll call you. <laughs> Do we have time? Are we OK time-wise? You sure? OK. Um, so ring, ring, ring. Hello. Hello, is this Ms. Gonzalez? Yes. Hi, Ms. Gonzalez. My name's Carrie Rose. I'm going to be Valerie's third grade teacher this year. How are you? I'm OK. <laughs> it's great to hear. It's great to hear your voice, Ms. Gonzalez. I'm very excited about being Valerie's teacher and hoping she has a great year. I'm calling today because I'd really love a chance to come to get to know you better and maybe do a home visit so you and I can just spend some time getting to know each other before the school year gets off to a big start. What do you want to know? <laughs> Mostly I want to know everything that you can tell me about how to help Valerie. I know that when I really connect with my families, I'm a better teacher. And I could really use your help just being a, the best teacher I can be for Valerie. You know her better than anyone, and I'm new this year to the class. So I thought it would be great if I could come by for maybe 20 or 30 minutes just so you and I could visit together a little bit about Valerie's year. Why can't I just tell you that when we start, the, when the school begins? Well, you Why do you have to come to my house? I don't have to. This is completely up to you. It's something I like to do because I don't live in the neighborhood here where the school is. So it's my chance to really get out and get to know the neighborhood. But also it's a chance for you and I to have a conversation that's really different than like, you know, back to school night or the conferences where everything's so rushed. So I won't have to do the conferences if you come? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to <laughs> Um, this is not intended to be a substitute for the conference. This is really, truly just to be intended. It's the intention of me coming is so you and I can just sit down and have a conversation about what's, what's Valerie's year going to look like? What's success for Valerie look like? I want you to get to know me. I want you to have a way to reach out to me. And I definitely would like to learn from you. All right. When do you want to come? Um, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'd love to come maybe Thursdays or Saturdays are my two days where I have the most flexibility. Would Thursday afternoon or evening be a possibility for you? Yeah, Thursday, uh, Thursday can work. Uh, Saturdays, no, I can't do Saturdays. That's my, my off time. Okay. I don't I want totally to know understand about that. school on Saturday. Sure. Yeah, no, no, totally understand. Um, how about Thursday, like around 3.30 or 4? Would that be Oh, possible? no, I don't get off till 5.00. Oh, that doesn't okay. work. OK, well, no problem. How about 5.30? Would that be enough time for you to get home and get settled? Yeah, OK, that's fine. OK, would this Thursday work? 
Oh no, next Thursday. Oh, I need okay. more time than next that. Next Thursday, okay, that's great. Um, and uh, I'd like to, if it's all right with you, I'd like to bring Mr. Jones with me. I Mr. thought it was only you, now yeah, there's two of you. Yeah, Mr. Jones is also going to be working with Valerie. We trade off math class and uh, reading together, so he'll have Valerie some of the time, just for one period for the class. So it's a chance for you to get to know both of the people that will be working with Valerie. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, sure, you're already coming. I guess one more, what's the difference? <laughs> All right, sounds great. So um, we'll plan on not this Thursday, next Thursday at 5.30. Mr. Jones and I will be there. I can call the day before just to make sure it's still a good time. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. And then just before we go, I wanted to just confirm your address. Are you still at, uh, where are we, 86 Lexington? No, we moved a long time ago. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I guess we need to update our records. Huh? Would you be willing to tell me your new address so I know where I should go? <laughs> sure. Um, 52 uh, New Britain Boulevard. New Britain Boulevard. <laughs> New Britain. Okay. Britain. Sounds great. Okay. I, okay. So I will give you a reminder call, and I really appreciate you doing this. Please don't go to any trouble. We're just coming by for about 30 minutes. It'll just be us. We just want to get a chance to know you a little bit better. I won't. Don't worry. I have to go. Oh, okay. okay. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So that, I mean, it's a basic phone call, but, but there's, you know, really that's the, it's so hard because first of all, we ask the teachers to make the call. So it's not like somebody in the front office is making the call for them. It's the beginning of the relationship building. Um, and, but it's got to have the, who are you? What do you want? <laughs> How long is it going to take? And who's coming with you? Like you have to really get that out pretty quick so that people understand whether it's something they want to buy into or not. Yes. Um, so I'm a family liaison, my position is new, and I know the camera's on. <laughs> um, I sometimes I feel like it's just a uh, tick in the box, right? Let's go over to a family engagement. Right. First thing people ask me is, do you do home visits? Right. Um, and I'm wondering, is there value in me doing home visits without a teacher? Um, well, you know, there's the short answer, which is there's always value in doing home visits. Right. But when we started this, we had to have a strategic conversation for ourselves about, like, at what point do we work with a school? Like, if there's two teachers who are willing to go, do we work with a school? And we had to really decide, like, are we looking to change a couple of classrooms, or are we trying to do whole school change? And we sort of opted on the end. Officially, we end up doing a lot of work with two teachers at school. We just did it in New York, but it's not our official strategy. <laughs> um, but the official strategy is, if we're going to go in and do a training, we want to know that at least half the staff are interested in participating. Because we want to see something that could grow school-wide. So I would say always do it and then invite a teacher who you think would be open to it to come with you because you never know what sparks will grow for them with their colleague. But if you want to see school-wide change, it has to be more than one or two people. Yeah. Yeah? Sure. yeah. I was just responding to that. I, and you've been doing this work for a very long time. But <coughs> if you have two teachers who want to do it, yeah. Go with it. Yep. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Mean, because that can start the revolution. That can start the movement. Totally. So which is why unofficially, right? Absolutely. So we have two teachers in a middle school who, by the way, all right, so one, actually it was a parent advisor, right, who uh -huh. had been a parent advisor for nine years and a music teacher. And they're going to do 60 visits together. They had done 10. They're going to visit all the music teachers. And they couldn't get anyone else on the staff to do it this year because of a variety of reasons. But they said, next year we'll do it. You just tell us if it's really a good idea or not, right? So they couldn't get support. They couldn't get funding. We went anyway. We talked to them. Um, but how we're going to help them is we're like getting them up in front of people at a conference. We're asking. We're tweeting out stuff. We're sharing their story. So it is possible mm -hmm. to build something with a couple of people. Um, just strategically for a whole school turnaround, it takes a lot longer to go that route. I agree with you. Do it anyway, because if that's your only option, go for it. Um, but if you want to see faster school turnaround, you want to try and get more staff on board up front. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Good. Thank I you. Like this revolution idea. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.